Well, good evening. You're welcome to Freedom in Christ Ministries. Go to our website sometime, www.ficm.org or ficminternational.org. Let me just reiterate something. Uh, the purpose of Freedom in Christ Ministries is to equip the church worldwide, enabling them to establish their people alive and free in Christ through genuine repentance and faith in God to the glory of God. Uh, we're not a counseling ministry. I mean, we do that all over the world, but uh, we want to equip the church. We believe that, that the church is the answer. If Neil Anderson wanted to start uh, some counseling centers around the country, I think we could do very well. But that's not where our heart is at. Our heart is making fruitful disciples, people who can reproduce themselves, people who have found their identity and their freedom in Christ, who are secure and have that peace. Now, we've been discussing uh, our basic message in terms of this uh, strongholds of our mind. Last week, we talked about the fact that here I am, I'm, I'm this new creation in Christ. I've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved son. I'm no longer in Adam. I'm in Christ. Uh, I'm a child of God. My soul is in union with God. I'm in Christ, in him, in the beloved. I mean, this is, this is the, the whole message of the New Testament, to be rooted in Christ, to grow in Christ, to live in Christ. Everything comes back to the fact that we are children of God, that our soul is in union with God. My body's a temple of God, and I have that union right now. I have the mind of Christ, the Holy Spirit. My body's a temple of God. You know, this is all great, great news. I said, but the tragedy is, <clears throat> is that when we come to Christ, all that's true. Nobody pushed the clear button here. Everything that was programmed into my memory is still there. That's why Paul writes, he says, no longer be conformed to this world, because you still can be, for that matter. Still read the wrong literature, believe the same old lies, this kind of thing. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, there's no instant way to do that. And then we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul talks about the weapons of our warfare are divinely powerful. We're not talking about defensive armor here. We're talking about battering ram uh, offense against the strongholds that have been raised up against the knowledge of God. And then we shared how those strongholds are made. Uh, they're just assimilated from the environment of which we are raised in because when we were born dead in our trespasses and sins, we didn't have that union with God. Uh, so we learned to live our lives independent of God, and we all did, and we all did differently. And uh, those strongholds are, are simply assimilated from the environment of which we're raised in, primarily two different ways. Uh, primarily, really, through just prevailing experiences, the home I was raised in, the schools I went to, etc., but also traumatic experiences. It took me years to realize that people are not in bondage to past traumas. They're in bondage to lies they believe because of the trauma. So a divorce happens in the home. It's my fault. Uh, I'm abused in some way. You know, God doesn't love me. And, and those things are deeply entrenched and can stay in your mind the rest of your life until we learn to deal with those issues. Now, here's the point, though. See, what those are are flesh patterns. They're memory traces. They're neural pathways in your brain. Nothing magical about this. Uh, psychologists often call them defense mechanisms, but that's a narrower scope. Flesh patterns cover the en entirety of this old nature, this, this person that I was before Christ, still programmed into my mind. Now, if, if my computer's been programmed wrong, can I reprogram it? Yes. If I've been trained wrong, can I be retrained? Of course. If I've learned something wrong, can I learn it right? If I bought a lie, can I renounce a lie and choose the truth? Yes. But then we warned you last week, I said, that unfortunately is not all that's going on. If you want to reprogram your computer, you better also check for viruses. And that's what we're going to look at tonight, is uh, this battle that is going on for our minds. Now, in my own experience of this, <laughs> people, let me just be honest with you. I was... Uh, a left-brained aerospace engineer at one time. I, I was so left-brained, my head tilted on one side. I thought there was a natural answer for everything, a natural explanation. And then when I come to Christ, I realized that is simply not true. And then I had to grow a lot more before I started to realize, because of my Western rationalism and naturalism that really shaped my worldview, I had to adopt a biblical worldview that understood that the God of this world 
is Satan himself, that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Paul is clearly warned us about this. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, no other place in uh, Paul's writings does he ever make a statement like this. He said, the Holy Spirit explicitly says, in latter days, people will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceiving spirits and teachings of demons. Folks, that is happening right now all over the world. I personally have counseled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who are struggling with blasphemous, condemning thoughts, some people hearing voices. No exceptions, folks. To this day, that's been a spiritual battle. We've learned to sit down with these people in a very rational way, never lose control, just deal with that person, help them submit to God, resist the devil, and walk off free. Many, for the first time in their life, are experiencing the peace of God that passes all understanding, guarding their heart and their mind in Christ Jesus. You know, one of the best ways that you can determine your spiritual condition right now is just get totally alone. Just close your eyes. What's your mind like right now? Is it quiet? Is it peaceful? How well can you tolerate solitude? If you feel like you have to just get up and run, if you feel like you have no mental peace, then there's good news for you, folks there actually is the potential to have a peace of God that passes all understanding. And that's why we're doing this webinar is to help folks with that. Much of this, unfortunately, in our world has been passed off as mental illness. Let me read a, an email I got not too long ago. It says, for years, ever since I was a teenager, I'm now 36, I had these, quote, voices in my head. There were four in particular, and sometimes what seemed loud choruses in them. When the subject of schizophrenia would come up in television or in a magazine, I would think to myself, I know I'm not schizophrenic, but what is this in my mind? I was tortured, mocked, jeered. Every thought I had was second-guessed. Consequently, I had zero self-esteem. I often used to wish the voices would be quiet, and I often wondered if other people had this as well, or if it was common. You see, here's the problem, folks. We can't read each other's minds. We have no idea what is going on in the mind of anybody else. Suppose somehow I had a way to attach electrodes to your brain and everything you thought for the next 24 hours was flashed up on the screen and we all could see it. Any volunteers? <laughs> the interesting thing about that is it's probably a God thing that we can't read each other's minds. But on the other hand, it's a curse because almost everybody I've talked to thought they were the only ones who were struggling in this way. We're all struggling in this way. When Paul says we wrestle not with flesh and blood, principalities and powers, he's talking about all of us, not a few of us or some of us. We're all in this battle, whether we like it or not. She said, when I started to learn from, me, from you about taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and read a few months back about people's experiences with these voices, I came to recognize them for what they were, and I was able to make them leave. This was an amazing and beautiful thing to be fully quiet in my mind after so many years of torment. I do not need to explain further all the wonderful things that come with this freedom of the mind. It's a blessing you seem to know well. Know well and appreciate very much for that matter. Now, how do we explain that? Am I the only one dealing with people who are... Uh, hearing voices or struggling with their thoughts and have no mental peace? Absolutely not. Every psychiatrist in the country, every counselor has people that they're seeing. The problem is they explain it a different way. Uh, typically, what you will hear is, well, they have a chemical imbalance. Now, ask yourself some questions. You know, I want to be fair here. I, I'm not arrogant about this, but we can ask some legitimate questions. How can my neurotransmitters randomly fire and create a thought that I'm opposed to thinking? And you have a natural explanation for that? Or how can a chemical produce a personality and a thought? Well, it can't. But that's what you're going to hear. Uh, and what you hear in terms of explanation is, well, I gave them antipsychotic medications and the voices stopped. Well, sure. So did everything else. All you did was narcotize it, remove the medicine, and it's right back. The problem of it is you haven't cured anything. You just covered it up. Uh, if you aren't aware of this, you really should be. One of the major reasons that people 
uh, become alcoholic or addicts is they have no mental peace. And so they drown it out with a little alcohol or drugs only to wake up the more, next morning just a little bit worse off. And, and I want to get beyond that and help these people actually find some resolution to these kind of problems because we are promised that peace from God himself, the Prince of Peace. Now, think about this, because I've had people sit in my office and go, look at that, and uh, don't bother look because you won't see a thing, folks. Uh, I had a gal come in one time. She uh, had really been struggling for a long time, and she said, uh, as we were working through this, because I always ask the question, would you like to resolve these issues? Nobody's ever said no, by the way. I said, with your permission, then, I'd like to lead you through these steps to freedom. So we're going through it. As soon as we started, and she starts to become frightened. And uh, I said, what are you seeing right now in your mind? You mean you don't see him there? I said, who? My father's standing right there. Now, don't bother to look because you won't see a thing. I said, tell me about your father. And later on, a grandmother showed up. Now, I'm dealing with people who are seeing things in the room I don't see, and they're hearing things I don't hear. Now, you can understand the secular world being a little bit confused by that. And so they don't see anything natural out there, so it must be in here. And typically what will happen is they will deem that as some kind of a mental illness. And I want to suggest to you there's another explanation. How do we see something? You can't see anything physically unless there is a light object reflecting off of a material object. Back to your uh, iris and your eye and... Uh, the nerve channel to your brain. That's how you see. You turn off all these lights in this room, you wouldn't see me. Turn it back on, I'm not here, you wouldn't see me. So when people see something in the room and uh, nobody else sees it, I mean, I can see why the secular world would assume that something is wrong in their mind because there's nothing there. And I said, the problem with it, it wasn't out there, it actually was here. I remember uh, a couple came to me one night and said, uh, our daughter keeps coming into our room. She's only about four years old. And say, Mommy, there's something in our room. And, uh, of course, we go in the room and we look under the bed in the closet. Honey, there's nothing there. Go back to sleep. Now, you're an adult. You saw something in your room. Would you go back to sleep? Probably not. But I looked. There was nothing there. The problem is it wasn't out there. It was right here. And it's the same problem with voices. How do you hear? You don't physically hear anything unless... Somehow there's a sound source. That's just a compression and a rare fraction of air molecules that travels at the speed of sound, hits your ears like a transducer, and that sends a signal to your brain. You can't talk in outer space, for instance, because there's no medium to do that. So all of this phenomena in the physical realm that we're having uh, has to be come under the concept of the fact we wrestle not with flesh and blood. It's not a physical problem. It's not a natural problem. It's a spiritual problem. And the problem is not out there, it's here. It's a battle for our own personal minds. Now, the question is, does Scripture actually teach this? Uh, let me give you kind of an interesting illustration. If you read through the Gospels, there will be three or four times when Jesus would tell them what's on their heart or something that somehow or another, where did you get that information from? And what would they say? You have a demon. They said that of Jesus. Now, Unfortunately for them, they had no clue that they're dealing with the Son of God and that he knows the thoughts and intentions of our heart. But at that time, amongst the religious establishment, for somebody to have that kind of esoteric knowledge, knowledge that doesn't come through the normal channels of perception, the assumption was that a demon taught them that. That phenomenon is still going on today. There are psychics out there who are channeling demons. The whole New Age movement is almost based on that, of people going to somehow kind of a trance and they empty their mind and, and they become a channel for, quote, spirit guides. What an amazing time we live in. Just change the name from demon to spirit guide and from uh, medium to channeler and suddenly a gullible public buys into it. And so are they uh, hearing things that are giving them that kind of information? Absolutely. In fact, they will tell you that. I mean, they're not quiet about it. What they, what they would totally react to is that I would call it a demon, of course. Well, let me look at just some examples in Scripture. In uh, 1 Chronicles 21, 
Verse 1, then Satan stood up against Israel and incited David to number Israel. Now, how did he do that? Uh, did he sit down with a pitchfork and a red outfit and sit in front of him and talk to him in a natural realm? No, no. No, these were David's thoughts. Or at least he thought they were. See, there's the deception. If thoughts come to you like that, first person, singular, I'm stupid, I'm dumb, I'm no good. Or like standing on a cliff and suddenly you have this thought, jump. I know you've had that happen, folks. I mean, almost everybody has had that happen. Or steer into that car or hit somebody. I mean, that's all precipitated by a thought that people have in their mind. They may not recognize it as the term voices. Here's the interesting thing about David. David had a whole heart for God. And what's wrong with numbering the people of Israel? I mean, would we do that today? Do you think the United States knows how many troops we have in Saudi Arabia or somewhere else in the world? Absolutely. But in those days, now the captain of his guard knew what was wrong and tried to stop him, but David did it anyhow and thousands died as a result of it. Uh, now understand something, David had a whole heart for God. The devil's not going to go to somebody like David and probably most any Christian listening right now and say, I want you to sacrifice your babies. That's not going to happen. Uh, first of all, you would know that that's not you and that's not where it comes from. And uh, But take somebody like David. I mean, the great king that he was and the great leader and whatever else. A man who had a whole heart for God and get him, just tempt him a little bit to put his confidence in how many troops he has his own resources instead of God's resources. Now, do you think that's happening in this world today? Every Christian leader, I can almost guarantee you, is being tempted in a similar kind of a fashion. Uh, so uh, don't expect that all your spiritual go battle is going to be some bizarre thing. It can be so subtle that uh, we just totally miss it, don't know where it's coming from. I mean, there were... Uh, and most of this we really can't share, especially in our culture. I find it's much easier when I go to Latin America and Africa and Indonesia and places like that because people are actually much more aware about this and more willing to talk about it. But if you expose that you're hearing voices to somebody in this country, immediately you're going to put on some medication or people are going to think you're something wrong with you, that you're mentally ill. And so people don't tell that. They don't share it. So we walk around thinking, Am I the only one who has this problem? The answer is no, you're not. Everybody here has had those kind of thoughts. Let me give you a couple of illustrations. One of our, uh, my faculty member at the seminary I taught at, um, wife got pneumonia. I mean, this is a wonderful couple. Uh, probably the most pious couple on our faculty, actually. They would take their summers and go on mission trips and just to help folks. And, and she got pneumonia. They couldn't figure it out, you know, what was, where it was coming from. Finally, they went in and took a liter and a half fluid out of her lungs. Then they found the cancer. And immediately she went on treatment for that. And I went on a tour that summer myself. When I came back, I got a call from uh, her husband. And he said, uh, could you see my wife? She's just really struggling. She's just fearful. And uh, you, you're probably the normal person. Well, you know, she's probably facing death, and that's what she is afraid of. And uh, so I said, sure, I'll come over there. She wanted to talk to me alone. And uh, she grabbed something. I share with you sometime. I said, we have a list of who we are in Christ. And she said, I just want you to know, she said, that's kept me afloat for these last few months. She said, Neil, I'm not sure I'm a Christian. I said, honey, if you're not a Christian, I'm in deep trouble. Why would you even think that way? She said, when I go to church, I have these blasphemous thoughts, these foul thoughts. I said, honey, that's not you. Did you want to think those thoughts? Did you make a conscious choice to think those blasphemous thoughts in church? No. Then why do you think they're yours? Well, she had never given, been given an alternative to that. And, uh, and frankly, with her maturity, half an hour later, those voices were all gone. You know, she went through two years of uh, almost torture, a lot of treatment for her cancer, and God took her home. The most amazing thing was at her funeral, all of the testimonies were for the last two years of her life. She never once questioned her salvation. Now, why was she afraid, really? She was afraid because she knew that she was facing the prospect of death, 
And if I'm hearing these voices, how can I hear these voices and be a Christian? And by the way, for those of you who've read my literature, all the testimonies that I share in all my books have all been by professing Christians, from missionaries and pastors all the way down. Uh, so don't assume that a Christian can't be under attack like this, folks. Well, we've been clearly warned that that is the case. This is a little list that we have of our identity in Christ. You can find our refrigerators all around our country, and our, our office would be happy to give you and make those available to you if you want them. Uh, e even that alone, by the way, has, uh, has just really set people off, and, and, and the majority, of course, in a great way. I remember uh, a man who was chairman of our board at one time, a woman comes in and said, uh, I've had it and I'm going to get a divorce. I had, it isn't working. And he said, I just didn't know what to do. So we reached back and grabbed that list. I said, why don't you just first read this out loud? And she started to read who she was in Christ. And all of a sudden she just broke down. She said, for the first time, I feel some hope. I also had a gal who was deeply tormented by the evil one in my office uh, start to read that. And, and she just threw it down. She said all the letters were running off the page. Now, I have no idea what she saw, but, but it was amazing. Let me look at another one. Let's take one of the Lord's disciples, albeit Judas. But listen to what John said. Supper, uh, being already over, had, Satan had already put into the heart of Judas to betray, betray Judas, uh, Jesus. And they said, well, he was a thief, that's why he did it. Well, that flesh pattern truly may be why he was vulnerable. But scripture clearly says that it was the devil who put that into his heart to betray Christ. And when he realized what he had done, come to his senses, he went on and hung himself. The devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Uh, or you look at the early church. Here's the, the early church. I mean, in exciting times, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. I mean, people were adding on to the numbers of thousands a day kind of a thing. It must have been an incredible time to live. Signs of wonders were being performed by the, by the uh, apostles. And, and, uh, and so they decided to share everything in common. And then Ananias and Sapphira, for some reason, chose to tell everybody they gave it all, but they left some for themselves. And Peter says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And God struck him dead. I mean, it's an incredible passage if you think about it. I mean, that's not exactly what we would call horrendous sin today. If the whole church gave half of everything they owned, we'd probably have a revival in six months. No, the sin was they gave half, allowing people to think it was all. But look who was credited to give given that idea. Satan. That's scripture. That's what scripture tells us. And by the way, filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit is exactly the same word that is being used to be filled with the Spirit that Paul uses. The point of it is, whatever you yield yourself to, to that you're going to be filled or controlled. And so we have these examples. You still are left kind of with the question, why was the judgment so severe? You struck them down, they're dead. If that happened next Sunday in our church, probably we'd all be dead. Uh, I think God had to send a clear early message to the church that if Satan could get into your home, your life, your family in any way and get you to believe a lie, he could control your life. What do you think about that for a moment? Let's say I was sick or devious enough tonight to get you to believe a lie. Maybe not that huge of one, but something that's not true about God or about yourself. And you believed it. Would that have some negative effect on your life? Yes, it would. What if you bought a whole pack of lies and just started living a lie? By the way, according to Scripture, who's the father of lies? And when you look at Jesus in John 17, what is his greatest concern as he's going to go to the Father and leave behind the 11, having already lost Judas? He said, I ask that you keep them from the evil one. Not take them out of the world. Keep them from the evil and sanctify them in their word. Their word is truth. When you put on the armor of God, the first thing you do is you gird your loins with truth. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So primarily what we're up against is the father of lies is going to try to deceive us. And the spirit of truth is going to lead us into all truth. And it's our choice which one we're going to listen to or believe. You're either going to be led by the God of this world or the God of the universe. Now, what's interesting about that is, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 
when he talks about these metal strongholds and how they're destroyed and how thoughts are raised up against the knowledge of God, etc. And then he brings it into kind of a present tense thing. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, I want people out there to be confident in Scripture and what I'm talking about, uh, to see it very clearly. So let me just point out something to you. Just some verses that you, I hope you would write down and, and just go back and look up. Take every thought captive. The word thought is the Greek word noema. I, I'm not a great Greek scholar. I don't want to give you that assumption. But I do know enough about it to be able to look up words and see what they mean and how they're used. Nothing has meaning without context. And really, usually is defines the meaning of it. And that particular word is only used about five, six times in Scripture. Strangely, four of the times are here in 2 Corinthians. But let me just share that with you uh, and give some explanation. Paul says in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive what I have forgiven. If I have forgiven anything, has been for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. For we, were, for we are not ignorant of his designs or schemes. That's the Greek word, noem. It's exactly the same word. Suffice it to say at this time, because in a few weeks we're going to be talking about forgiveness. I've had the privilege to help people who are struggling this way all over the world. I have really come to the conclusion myself personally that people who are bitter who won't forgive those who have offended them uh, affords Satan's greatest access to the church. Uh, the best way I can illustrate that to you in a practical way is that you've been hurt, and we're going to acknowledge that. People have been hurt all over this world, and you don't forgive that person for their sake. Really, you do it for your sake. It's an issue between you and God, and we'll explain that more later. But you ever go to night and can't sleep because that person or that act is on your mind and it just haunts you the rest of your life? That's what we're talking about. And that will keep you in bondage. It will keep you bound to your past until you learn to forgive from your heart. Uh, chapter 4 in the same book, it says, if, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world, that's Satan, has blinded the noema, the thoughts, the minds of the unbelieving. Now, how are we going to reach this world for Christ? if the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelieving. This is where prayer comes in, people. This is how we have to learn to pray. When you put on the armor of God, it's often overlooked, but it really ends with pray in the Spirit for all people, all the time. And again, we're going to come back and elaborate some more on that. But keep that in mind, because world evangelization is, is truly affected by our belief. In the early church, there's some really good documents, folks, that the, one of the major reasons that people turned to Christ was to free them of demonic influences. I personally feel that may be the greatest part of our evangelistic efforts at the end of the ages. So I think we need to be more than prepared. Uh, people all over this world now are struggling with thoughts like this, and we've been told clearly, explicitly, by the Holy Spirit that would be the case. And the only one who has an answer for that is the church. And that's why we are committed to, to equip the church to help these people. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your thoughts, there's the same word, would be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Well, I'm concerned too. Uh, you could say, well, I'm, I'm a pretty innocent person. You know, I, I, I really don't think that could happen to me. I said, do you realize that Eve had never sinned when she was deceived? Good people can be deceived. And if you're deceived, you don't know it. If you knew it, you're not deceived any longer. And so we have been warned uh, clearly from Scripture this way. The question then really is, is not, is this true, but what do we do about it? How do we help people who are struggling like this? How do we help people? Let me just give another take. Maybe you haven't looked at it this way. Uh, on a passage I'm sure you, most listeners are very familiar with. Philippians chapter 4. 
It says, do not be anxious about anything. Now, we're going to talk about anxiety disorders later. But the word anxious itself means double-mindedness. Uh, so don't be double-minded. Be single-minded. In other words, how do you become single-minded? Uh, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In other words, essentially, cast your anxiety in Christ, turn to God first. Um, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. Care to guess what that word is? Same word. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, it doesn't stop there. Uh, in the whole New Testament era of which we live under the New Covenant, God has a part, we have a part. Keep that in mind because in terms of helping people later on, that, that becomes critical in understanding who is responsible for what. Uh, so turning to God is always where we began. I mean, go to God first in prayer, cast your anxiety and get First thing you do about anything is pray. Just learn that and uh, save you a lot of heartache later on in life. But... Uh, uh, we have a responsibility, so turn to God. Now, he turns back on us and said, what should we do? He says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. How do you take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ? If it's not true, don't pay attention. What should you think upon? Think upon true things, pure things, right things. People who are anxious, what are they thinking on? Assumptions, things that, don't, that aren't true. I mean, you know, that's why they're anxious. Uh, people are, anxious, are not anxious about things they know. That may be fear. People are anxious about things they don't know. So they make assumptions about tomorrow and you act upon it. Through presumption comes nothing but strife and, and it's no good. But you're not done there yet, by the way. Don't, don't finish on verse 8, verse 9. What you have learned, received, and heard, and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. In other words, do the right thing. Do the kind thing. Do the peaceful thing. Do the honorable thing. If you only see something, and a week later, 90% of it you've lost. If you see something, almost the same thing. If you see and hear, it goes up. But if you see, hear, and do, the learning goes up dramatically. Just think in terms of remembering people's names. If you just hear it, if you're like me, it's gone in a minute or so later. But if I write it down, for instance, if I do the word, it's amazing how much more you can retain by doing that. Um, there actually is a process, and it's repentance, and we're going to cover that later. What, what I want to bring to your mind right now is just that uh, there actually is a peace of God. I, it's so troubling to me that so few Christians have ever really gotten there in their life where, they, where the peace of God is really part of their life. And, and almost all of that is due to a lack of genuine repentance. And that's what we're trying to equip the church, give them a tool so they can genuinely repent. Not uh, sorry they were caught and not just simple confession. And a confession itself is never enough uh, because you're going to sin and confess and confess and confess and I give up. It's sin and confess, that means agree with God, and then repent, make a change. And uh, Paul preached repentance wherever he went. Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. Now, should I rebuke every negative thought? Oh, Christian, that's all you would do the rest of your life. You'd be like you're out in the middle of a lake, and there's 12 corks around you, and you got a little hammer, and you're sitting there treading water trying to keep the corks submerged. And I said, all you'll do is wear yourself out. You'll never get out of that situation. What should you do? Ignore the stupid corks and swim to shore. We're not called to dispel the darkness. We're called to turn on the light. Do you see the difference? Now, for the next uh, five minutes, I don't want you to think any negative thoughts, or how hungry you are, or how tired you are, or uh, don't think about anything that's pornographic. Just don't think about that. Is that what you're thinking about right now? Chances are it is. I said, nowhere in Scripture does it tell you to do that. It doesn't tell you to stop thinking that thought. It tells you to think this thought. Think the truth. Think what's right, lovely, and pure. And keep doing that. Now, this isn't the end of our webinar here. Uh, because we got a whole process by which we help people gain that freedom. Uh, I often kind of use an illustration 
with folks. I said, when you step out of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved son, Jesus said on the door in John 10, he said, the path is narrow to begin. And it really is. I said, so you step through that door. And at that moment, you're a believer. You're a born again child of God. Uh, you've, you've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved sons. And you can see Jesus. He's ahead of you, right ahead of you. And there's nothing there that will keep you from walking towards him. But on both sides, it's like there's two-story buildings. And people are popping their heads out. You're stupid. You're dumb. You're ugly. Or pimps come on in. You psst, You can do this and you know you'll get away with it. Now, there's three responses to that. One is the guy steps through the thing and he just pays attention to it. He listens to them and, and, uh, and believes the lie and you're stupid, you're dumb, and you're ugly, and, and they, just, they just buy it. They're actually probably believers. They're probably born again. They step through the door, but they don't understand the battle for their mind. Nobody's ever explained that to them. And so they just sit there. They make no progress at all. They don't grow. And then there's the next guy. He comes along and says, no, I'm not going to do that. You can't make me. I'm not going in there. And boy, I'm fighting the good fight. I said, not really. You're kind of losing it. You're totally letting the devil set the agenda. Don't pay attention to it. Put up the shield of faith and it stands against those fiery darts. Fix your eyes on Jesus and just keep on walking. And you, what will happen is, is that path will get broader and broader and broader. And those thoughts will get dimmer and less and fewer and fewer. And it'll just keep doing that. Uh, one of the things that we need to understand is what Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 3. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. How are you going to do that? Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Uh, think of your mind like a coffee pot. And uh, you put the coffee in there and you can taste it, smell it, you can see it. And one day you decide, I'm going to clean up my mind. Now, the moment you decided to do that, did it get worse or better? It probably got worse, didn't it? I remember back when I was an aerospace engineer, uh, I read something, I was just a new believer, I read something that a man had some thought of sex as an average every seven minutes. And man, I think I was beating that one two to one. And I just thought, why is this so hard? It, it was just a constant, seemingly struggle. I didn't like it, I didn't want it. Uh, you know, and I was probably a pretty innocent guy at that time, maybe compared to others, but nobody's innocent, of course. But it was just a struggle. And the moment, the more I would focus on that, trying to not think those thoughts, frankly, they seemed to get worse. And uh, But so here's this coffee. I, I want that coffee. I want a crystal clear mind. Well, no clear button. We talked about that. No delete button. So there it is. It's in my mind. I stuck it in there. And uh, now, imagine a bowl of crystal clear ice sitting right alongside, and on it it says the Word of God. Now, dear people, I wish that we could take that whole bowl and dump it in, but you can't. But you can take one cube a day, one cube a day. The Psalm 109 says, How shall a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that it may not sin against you. Uh, now, if you kept doing that, just putting in a cube a day, cube a day. Truth, truth, truth. What would happen after a period of time, you really would not not hardly even taste or smell or even see the coffee. It's still there, by the way. Uh, no clear button. Um, now, that'll work, provided it's not one cube, one peek at the internet, and one cube, and one Playboy magazine. If you're doing that, you're treading water at best. Somehow or another, you have to stop that process. And I'm just going to Focus over here and I'll keep rooting in my mind. I'm going to fix my eyes in Jesus, the author and finisher of my faith. And you keep doing that, and after a while, broader and broader. And uh, for some people, that's two steps forward, one back. Three steps forward, one back. Five steps forward, one back. Twenty steps forward, one back. hundred steps forward, one back. There is no instant maturity. But I'll just leave you with this tonight. If you've got some questions, let us know. Uh, you can do that if you're free. If you're experiencing the freedom of God, if you know who you are, if you're not, if you don't understand this battle for your mind, you're, you're just treading water out in some lake someplace and getting nowhere. And uh, so what we've learned to do is to help them resolve the conflicts that are critical between themselves and God through genuine repentance 
And once that conflict is resolved, then the Spirit of God is within you. And that whole process becomes so measurably easier. I mean, we're still living in this fallen world. We still need to put on the armor of God. But now, suddenly, the war is winnable. And that's what we want to do, is to help you win this war. Now, you have any questions? Question. <clears throat> do you think that panic disorder and agoraph agoraphobia, ag yes, thank you, <laughs> may actually be spiritual warfare? Yes, I just released uh, a book. This came out this year, I think, Letting Go of Fear. Probably backwards for you, but this is the book, Letting Go of Fear. Where we talk about fear, fear is the number one mental health problem of the world. It was the first emotion that uh, Adam expressed after he had fallen. 400 times uh, we, have the, we see the commandment in the Bible to fear not. Telling somebody that, however, probably isn't going to work. And um, so we are going to, in this webinar, <clears throat> probably in a month or two, uh, talk more seriously about fears and phobias and panic attacks, etc. Uh, the problem that we're dealing with here, folks, is that fear of anything other than God is mutually exclusive to faith in God. And, and the real tragedy is, is that more people are sitting in our churches are afraid of Satan than they are of God. There's not a verse in the Bible word of fear of Satan. It's the fear of God that's the beginning of wisdom. And the moment that you elevate him as a greater object of fear, you elevate him as a greater object of worship. This can't be more serious. Uh, we've got to deal with this. And it's fear is just paralyzing people all over the world right now. Uh, there can be a physical basis for panic attacks, and I'll explain that later. But many times, and we've got several testimonies in the book itself, uh, telling people how they've come out of this. And so, and anxiety is a little different issue than fear. Uh, so we'll cover that uh, more thoroughly later. The next question. I have a school teacher, and she's concerned that her students are struggling with many of the things you're talking about. She said, how can I help them? Well, <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, most of our public school teachers uh, are handcuffed. They really can't deal with spiritual problems. I've come across several psychiatric nurses that are just uh, frustrated out of their mind because they know exactly what I'm talking about. They sense the same thing with people that they're dealing with, but they can't deal with it. They can't use it. I remember several years ago, I was doing a conference when uh, Swindoll was pastor of Evangelical Free Church in Southern California at his church. And uh, a man who was head, really, of the uh, uh, psychological hospitals in, in uh, Orange County stood up and said, I'm a recovering cognitive therapist. <laughs> it was really funny. He said, what I've learned, he said, they can tell me that I can't pray for my client, but they can't tell my client he can't pray. And I thought for a while, I said, you know, that may work for a while. And sure enough, it did work for a while. A year later, he was fired, unfortunately. Um, by the way, if you're a therapist or work in that field, uh, Northwestern University in Minneapolis um, Christian School uh, hosted a seminar that we did for professional counselors and uh, it was really kind of based on a book we brought, Christ Centered Therapy. And uh, uh, I think we showed them a way that they can and meet the board's requirement of the state. Uh, I said if somebody will come in and talk to a, a nurse or, or psychologist or psychiatrist and they will sign a sheet you know saying I agree to be counseled from a Christian worldview perspective. Uh, really, the state boards can't touch them because that's really consistent with what they say themselves. And uh, But you would need a signed statement from them agreeing to do that. And then you can treat them like a Christian, and which you should do anyhow. And so uh, I will have a lot more to say about uh, Christian counseling later on. I just, I've got one other lady here who's... Uh church pianist and she has panic attacks where it makes her even fear leaving the home. She says she has to travel a lot, but she's barely able to leave her house for fear of panic attacks. And she said, I've been staying in scripture, rebuking the enemy long enough to start making progress and it repeats. Any and suggestion? I, uh, I don't want to sound redundant again, but I, I, I'm, I am going to talk about that later on. And unfortunately, um, uh, 
if you would just take the time to read my last, hopefully, revision of The Bondage Breaker. It's just totally rewritten. just came out. And, uh, but here's, here's a good way to end tonight. To think. I wanted to say to the dear lady who asked that question, in the book are the steps to freedom in Christ. It is something you can go through on your own. And obviously I encourage you to do that. It's an encounter between you and God. Uh, most sessions like that are more profitable if you can sit down with the trained encourager to help you. But it is something you can do. I know because I get letters from people all over the world uh, uh, telling how they personally have found their own freedom in Christ. And so God is the one who sets you free. I can't do that and bind up your broken heart. So I just want to close with this testimony. And the reason I love this one so much is uh, Daryl Fitzgerald and Stephanie, his wife, are a black couple. And they're on our, our staff and just doing an incredible job helping people. And we're trying desperately to equip the African-American church in this country uh, to help them with some of the issues that they struggle with, like all churches struggle with, of course. This actually was his first experience, and it was uh, uh, with a gal on, on a church staff that uh, was a children's director. And uh, she had gone, well, I'll let her tell her story. But uh, just to kind of tell you, it doesn't take a great deal of experience. I, I honestly can teach a, a pastor in half a day how to do what we're doing if they're mature themselves and know the Bible well. But let me just close tonight with this story. She said, I thought my story was unique, but I often wondered if anyone else had the spiritual conflict I was suffering with. My problem began a couple years ago. I was experiencing terribly demonic nightmares and had nights during which I felt the presence of something or someone in my room. One night I woke up feeling like someone was choking me and I could not speak or say the name of Jesus. I was terrified. I sought help from church leaders and pastors. They had no idea how to encourage me. Eventually, fear turned into panic anxiety disorder, and my thoughts were so loud, destructive, and frightening that I visited my primary care provider. I thought for sure she would understand my belief that this was a spiritual battle. When I expressed the idea that the enemy was attacking me, she responded by diagnosing me with bipolar disorder and told me that I would be on medication for the rest of my life. She also gave me a prescription for antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds. I was devastated. I told my husband the diagnosis and he assured me that it wasn't true. I decided not to take the medication. I just didn't have any peace about doing that. My pastors prayed over me, but nothing changed. I began Christian counseling, which helped a bit, but it was nowhere near worth the $400 a month that I paid. When I told my Christian counselor about what was happening in my mind and about my fears, she too said, I think it's time for medication. It seemed like everyone I thought was crazy. No one believed that my problem was spiritual. Thankfully, I came across one of your books and read stories of people I could relate to. I knew there were answers. That was an answer. It was in that book that I first heard of the steps to freedom in Christ. Honestly, I was afraid of the steps at first. I didn't know what to expect. But one of the pastors had recently met Dr. Anderson and was learning how to lead people through the steps. He offered to help me. I accepted. Going through the steps was one of the most difficult yet incredible things I've ever done. I experienced a lot of interference, such as a headache, confusion. But having the Holy Spirit revealed to me all that I needed to renounce was incredible. When I prayed and asked God to bring to my mind the sins of my ancestors, I was shocked at all that came up. I don't even know my ancestors. I later asked my mother about the things that came to my mind during the session, and she confirmed that my family had been involved in those things. I was amazed by how the Holy Spirit brought out the truth. After going through the steps, my mind was completely silent. It was amazing. There was no nagging thoughts. I was totally at peace. I wanted to cry with joy. After that, I wasn't afraid of being alone, and the nightmares were gone. I didn't have to play the piano or television to drown out the terrible thoughts. I could sit in silence and be still. Next week, we're going to talk about emotional freedom. Thanks for listening. Thanks for following Freedom in Christ Ministries. If you enjoyed watching or listening to this teaching, please follow and share us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter.